Hello and welcome to this Biology 6 lecture on the muscular system. Now, I'm sure you're familiar with the many names of muscles that you learned in your anatomy class. Uh, like, you know, for instance, this is the bicep muscle and back here is the tricep muscle and you probably know the deltoid muscle and the pectoralis major. Um, all of those muscle names that you learned in your anatomy class are muscle organs, but the major tissue that each muscle organ is made out of is called muscle tissue. So let's begin this lecture talking a little bit about muscle tissue. So in the lecture handout, it defines it like this. It says muscle tissue is a tissue that A, causes movement by contracting, B, holds body posture, and C, generates body heat. Uh, so let's kind of dissect that. So. Uh, Muscle tissue is a tissue that causes movement. So, um, for example, your muscles cause movement of body parts, like moving your arm, moving your leg, moving your fingers, moving your neck. All that is, uh, is, is all that movement of body parts is done by contracting muscles. But muscles also cause movement of substances within the body. For instance, the muscles are used to propel the food that you swallowed from your stomach to your intestines. Um, anyway, so uh, muscle tissue causes, causes movement of, the, of body parts or substances within the body uh, by contracting, meaning the muscle organ gets shorter. Uh, another part of that muscle tissue definition is that it holds body posture, and that just means it, it helps you stand upright. Just as one example, um, you have some muscles that clamp down on your knee joint to keep your knee joint straight so you can stand upright. Uh, saying the same thing in a slightly different way, if those muscles in your around your knee joint stopped contracting on the knee joint, your knee joint would bend from your body weight and you would just collapse to the ground. So in that sense, your muscles uh, allow you to, to stand upright. Your, your muscles allow you to, to have your body posture. And the last part of the definition of muscle tissue is that it helps generate body heat. That just means that muscle tissue... Um, is one of the main types of tissue that provides your body heat. Okay, so of all these parts of muscle tissue, you know that causing movement and holding posture and gener generating body heat, in this lecture, we are going to focus mostly on uh, the movement of body parts. And the just as an example, I'm going to tend to use the bicep as an example of uh, a muscle using body parts. Um, and well, uh, so as you, as you see in your lecture outline, uh, the the muscles cause movement of body parts by contracting. So let's kind of have a cartoon close up of the arm here and focus in on the bicep muscle, and we'll see how it causes movement of body parts by contracting. Okay, so here's my cartoon of the bicep muscle right here, and it's attached to this bone right here in the main part of your arm, and this bone right here is supposed to be a um, one of the bones in your forearm, the part of the the part of your um, arm that's nearest your hand. This is your hand right here. Um, anyway, so here's how uh, the basics of how uh, muscles cause movement of body parts. The muscle contracts, which means it's going to get its make itself smaller, and as it does, it pulls on those bones that it's attached to, and when the when the bones move because the muscle's pulling on on them, that moves the body part. So, for example, here's this bicep muscle is going to contract, and when it does, it pulls on the bones, and that causes movement of your body parts, you know, that, that uh, moved the, the forearm at the, at the elbow joint right here. Okay, so that's kind of an amazing thing, right? Uh, most tissues in your body can't contract themselves, can't make themselves smaller. Uh, so how is it that muscle tissue can can contract itself. How does it make itself smaller? Well, let me reset the uh, arm into a straight position here. Uh, the secret is the muscle cells. Of course, muscle tissue is made out of muscle cells. And so what I'm saying is it's actually the individual muscle cells that contract themselves. That's the secret of the muscle tissue contracting is that the muscle cells get shorter. Oh, incidentally, um, some textbooks refer to muscle cells as muscle fibers. I don't do that. I just call them muscle cells. But be aware when you're reading in your textbook for this class or other textbooks, they may say muscle fibers. That just means muscle cells. In any event, what, what I was saying is uh, muscle tissue gets shorter because the individual muscle cells uh, get shorter. 
And so let's now talk about that. How is it that muscle cells make themselves shorter? Oh, so here's the cartoon. You can see it there. The muscle cells that make up that muscle tissue got shorter. That's what made the muscle organ got sh get shorter, and that's what allowed the body part to be moved. Okay, so the question I was going to now, now address is, how do these individual muscle cells contract themselves? Well, um, here's uh, the big picture. Uh, so in other words, what I'm going to tell you right now is sort of the introduction to how muscle cells contract themselves. We're going to fill in a lot more details later on in this lecture. But anyway, here's the big picture. So there's a muscle cell. Uh, the contraction of muscle cells is controlled by motor neurons. Motor neurons are those neurons that that send nerve signals to muscle cells to make them to contract. So, uh, yeah, so muscle cells um, contract when they receive motor signals from motor neurons. There you see it. But that doesn't really answer the question, well, how did the muscle cell contract? In other words, what is it inside the muscle cell that allowed the muscle cell to contract? Well, let me kind of reset this cartoon. You can see that I put some things inside the muscle cell. Well. Uh, what that what those things inside the muscle cell are supposed to be are things called protein filaments. Um, you know what a protein is, and the word filament means anything that's shaped like a string. You know, sort of long and thin, the, the way a string is. And you can see that these these um, lines I'm putting inside the muscle cell they are kind of long and thin, like like a string, right? Yeah. So each muscle cell is filled with some protein filaments, and the protein filaments are what allow the muscle cell to contract. Um, there, there are two types of these protein filaments. Um, one type are called myosins. The ones that I'm showing in blue there are the myosin uh, protein filaments inside the muscle cell. And the other ones are called actins. The ones I'm showing in yellow there are the actin protein filaments inside muscle cells. Oh, incidentally, you can see that the myosin filaments are a little bit thicker than the actin filaments. So the myosin filaments are sometimes called the thick filaments and the actin filaments are sometimes called the thin filaments. Okay, so notice that here's this stack of myosin protein filaments right there. So notice the, the stack of myosin protein filaments has a stack of actins to its left and to its right. In other words, for every stack of myosin inside a muscle cell, there's a stack of actin filaments to its left and to its right. Okay, so what does all this have to do with uh, the muscle cell contracting? Well, when the muscle cell gets the motor signal to contract, what happens is those actin filaments slide inward on top of the myosins. There's the motor signal. Here we go. Yeah, so you see that there, the, the actin filaments slide inward over the myosins. And that's what allows the muscle cell to contract. Um, so notice that that's a more compact arrangement, right? When those actins slid inward, uh, these protein filaments are arranged more co compactly because the, the actins overlap more with the myosins. And since those stacks of actin and myosins are now more compact, more shorter, and since they are inside the muscle cell, that's what allows the muscle cell to contract is the, is the sliding inward of those, of those actins over the myosins. Notice none of, the, none of the proteins themselves got shorter. These myosins are just as long as they were before the muscle cell contracted, and likewise, these actins are just as long as they were before the muscle contracted. What happened is their arrangement got shorter by the actins sliding inward over the myosins. That's a more shorter, more compact arrangement. That's how the, the sliding filaments made the muscle cell, uh, made the muscle cell shorter. Okay, well, a few more things about, um, uh, about muscles uh, before we go on. Um, muscle cells can only generate force by contracting. In other words, they can only generate force by pulling on the bones. Like here's your bicep. It can only generate force by contracting and pulling on these bones here in the forearm. Saying the same thing in the opposite way, muscles cannot gen generate any force by making themselves bigger. Muscles just have no ability to push themselves to a larger size and push on your skeleton. They only generate force by contracting and pulling on your skeleton. Oh, and one more thing before we uh, go on. Uh, throughout this lecture, 
you're going to hear a lot of terms that begin with the word myo, M-Y-O, and you're also going to hear a lot of terms that begin with the word sarco, S-A-R-C-O. Both of those mean muscle. And so, yeah, just brace yourself for a lot of terms that begin with myo and sarco. In fact, I guess we've already seen one. We've, we've seen the word myosin protein filaments. Again, myo just means muscle, just like sarco means muscle. Okay, continuing on with our uh, lecture on muscle tissue, as it turns out, there are actually three types of muscle tissue. They are called skeletal muscle tissue, smooth muscle tissue, and cardiac muscle tissue. In your lecture handout, I've arranged um, descriptions of these three types of muscle tissue into a table. So yeah, so look in your lecture handout. There's a, a, a table where there's a column describing for skeletal muscle, things like its location and its function and some other things about skeletal muscle. And then in the middle column of that table, there's um, it talks about smooth muscle, again, its locations and its functions and some other things about it. And then also in that table, it describes cardiac muscle tissue, same things, its location and its function and other things about it. So what I want to do now is go through these three types of muscle tissue one at a time and talk about uh, their, their, their features and locations. Okay, so what you see pictured in this picture right here is skeletal muscle tissue. Uh, skeletal muscle tissue is attached to the bones. That's why they call it skeletal muscle tissue. But the skeletal muscles are attached to the bones by structures called tendons. If you see in this drawing right here, these gray structures right here and right here, for example, that attach these skeletal muscles to the bones, those are the tendons. Okay, yeah, so skeletal muscle is attached to bones by ways of these tendons, and its job is to move body parts. Uh, just like we saw a few minutes ago in the cartoon, uh, when skeletal muscles contract, they pull on the bones, and that causes movement of, of the body parts. Now, in your anatomy class, you learned the names of lots of muscles. All of those muscle names that you learned are skeletal muscles. So yeah, you're triceps and biceps and the brachialis, pectoralis majors, deltoids, uh, frontalis muscles, masseter muscles, quadriceps, um, uh, uh, gastric nemius, uh, all those muscle names that you earned in your, learned in your anatomy class, those are all skeletal muscles. Um, another thing about skeletal muscles is they are, they are voluntary muscles. And what that means is that you consciously choose when they contract and relax. And incidentally, skeletal muscles are the only type of muscles that are voluntary. Um, the other two types of muscle tissue, smooth muscle and cardiac muscle tissue, are not voluntary. You do not consciously control when those contract or relax. But for skeletal muscles, yes, you do consciously control them. So we say that they are the voluntary type of muscle tissue. All right, let's talk about the cells of skeletal muscle tissue. Here's what they look like. The shape of skeletal muscles, uh, skeletal muscle cells is described as long and cigar-shaped. Um, a few other features, uh, skeletal muscle cells have striations, which is just a fancy word for stripes. And you can see there's some, well, this is like a dark stripe, this area, and this is a, a light stripe, a dark stripe, light stripe, light stripe, dark stripe, light stripe. The whole, um, all, all along its entire length, the skeletal muscle cell has these striations, these alternating light stripes and dark stripes and light stripes and dark stripes. We'll talk about what these are, what causes these striations in skeletal muscle cells more a little bit later on in this lecture. But as a preview, it's the stacks of actins and myosins. Uh, so yeah, as a preview, remember that, that myosins are th thicker filaments found inside um, muscle cells. And so the stacks of myosin, because they, they are thicker, they cast a darker shadow. And so the dark striations are where there are where there's a stack of myosin but remember actins are thinner protein filaments inside muscle cells they're so thin they hardly cast any shadow at all and so they look uh, lighter under the microscope the regions of actins look lighter and so the actin stacks are the uh, lighter striations yeah so darker striations myosin stack lighter striations actin stack anyway the point for now is that skeletal muscle cells have striations they have these stripes, these uh, dark and light stripes. Another feature of skeletal muscle cells is they have more than one nucleus. 
these little blue things here in the nucleus. And so, yeah, they have multiple nuclei. Nuclei is just the plural of nucleus. And that's kind of interesting, right? Because pretty much every other cell in the body only has one nucleus. But skeletal muscle cells are different. They, they have multiple nuclei. Okay, let's move on to the second of the three muscle tissue types, which is called smooth muscle tissue. If you, oh, sorry, I wasn't, wasn't quite done with skeletal muscle tissue. Um, so in an actual um, skeletal muscle tissue, uh, the skeletal muscle cells are stacked on top of each other very tightly, like you see here. And so when you look at skeletal muscle tissue under a microscope, it looks something like this. And so you can see that there's like one long skeletal muscle cell right here. You can see its striations uh, and its multiple nuclei, the dark spots, and just stacked right below it here is yet another skeletal muscle cell, and stacked below that is yet another skeletal muscle cell, and here's another one, and here's another one, and here's another one. Yeah, so in skeletal muscle tissue, the skeletal muscle cells are stacked uh, on top of each other. Okay, so what I was about to say is, let's go on to the next type of muscle tissue, which is called smooth muscle tissue. If you look in the lecture handout, it says that the location of smooth muscle tissue is in the walls of the hollow organs of your body. So let me just stop there. You have obviously many different types of organs in your body. Not all, but some of these organs are hollow organs. For your example, for example, your stomach is a hollow organ, you know, so the food could go through there. And likewise, your intestines are also hollow organs, also so the food could go through them. Uh, your blood vessels are hollow organs, so the blood could go through them. Your bladder is a hollow organ, so the urine could go, could go through it. If you're a female, you have a uterus, and your uterus is a hollow organ, so the baby can, can be in there. Um, anyway, so the point I'm making is that not all, but many of your organs are hollow organs. And in the walls of all your hollow organs, that's where you find smooth muscle. Smooth muscle tissue is, is always part of the wall uh, of all hollow organs. And its function is to propel substances through the hollow organ. Um, you know, so you, your hollow organs are hollow because there's some substance that's going through that organ and that substance needs to be propelled through the organ. That's why you have the smooth muscle in the walls, is to propel the substance through the hollow organ. Um, you might wonder, well, how does the smooth muscle in the wall propel stuff through a hollow organ? And the answer is what I call the toothpaste principle. Imagine you've got a tube of toothpaste. You know, it's, it's a hollow tube with the toothpaste inside. But if you squeeze on your tube of toothpaste, that propels the toothpaste, right? That causes the toothpaste to come squirting out of the, the toothpaste tube. So the idea here, there is if you have a hollow structure and you squeeze on it, then it makes the substance inside flow through. Well, that's why your hollow organs have smooth muscles. The smooth muscles in your hollow organs, like your stomach here, contract. And just like your tube of toothpaste, that squirts the contents uh, through the organ. That makes the food in the, in the stomach squirt through and go to the next organ, which in this case is the small intestine. But then you get the same thing. The small intestine is a hollow organ, so its walls are smooth muscle. So when they squeeze, again, it's like the toothpaste principle that squirts the food into the next organ, which is the, uh, the large intestine. So I think you get the idea. The purpose of the smooth muscle in the walls of your hollow organs is so that the smooth muscle can contract, it can squeeze, and that propels the substance through the hollow organ. Smooth muscles are not voluntary muscles. That is, you do not consciously control when they contract or relax. For instance, you don't, ha you don't have to consciously tell your stomach or your small or your large intestines to contract. The body, um, your, your body handles the contraction and relaxation of your smooth muscles for you. You don't consciously control it. So they are, they are involuntary muscles. The uh, shapes of smooth muscle cells are kind of interesting. There's that skeletal muscle cell we looked at a few minutes ago. Uh, so here's the shape of a smooth muscle cell. So notice that the, the smooth muscle cells are a lot shorter than skeletal muscle cells. Uh, and they have pointed ends, you can see there. Um, and incidentally, uh, smooth muscle cells only have one nucleus per cell. And they do not have striations. They, uh, if you look at smooth muscle tissue under a microscope, it looks like just sort of a nice even shade of pink with none of the darker light striations that you see in skeletal muscle cells. And incidentally, that's why they call them call it smooth muscle tissue because it's a nice smooth shade of pink, not the alternating dark and, and light striations you get in skeletal muscle tissues. 
oh, let's, I think there's a, the next uh, picture is a microscope photograph of some smooth muscle tissue. Um, let's see. Um, so here's the nucleus of a smooth muscle cell, and you can see it comes to a pointed end either here or here. It's a little unclear. But anyway, so that's the nucleus, and so this right here is a smooth muscle cell. And here's another smooth muscle cell's nucleus right here. And you can kind of see it comes to a pointed end maybe over there a little bit. And here's yet a, the nucleus of another smooth muscle cell, and it comes to a pointed end there. Um, it's a little hard to see, but but you, you can see that each smooth muscle cell has one nucleus, the, the flattened blue areas, and that they come to a, a pointed end. They have, they're short with pointed ends. Okay, well, the last of our three muscle tissue types is called cardiac muscle tissue. It's found in the heart, and it's only found in the heart. The, the heart is the only place in the body that, ha that has cardiac muscle tissue. Uh, and the function of it is to uh, pump the blood for the heart. So the, the heart's job is to be the pump for the blood. Uh, the contractions of your heart are what make, uh, that's what, what propel the blood to circulate throughout your body. Um, and here's how it works. So the heart is a hollow organ and the chambers inside the heart fill up with blood. And then the cardiac muscle that makes the wall of the heart squeezes on the blood inside the heart and that squirts the blood out of the heart and makes it circulate throughout the body. In other words, it's just the toothpaste principle again. Uh, you know, again, just like when you squeeze a, a tube of toothpaste, that applies force and that s causes the toothpaste to squirt out of the tube. Same concept here in the heart. The cardiac muscle in, in the wall of the heart contracts. It squeezes on the blood inside the heart and squirt. That makes the blood squirt out of the heart and forces it to circulate uh, throughout the body. Cardiac muscle tissue is not voluntary. In other words, it's involuntary. You do not consciously control when your heart contracts. You do not consciously control when it relaxes. It's, it's, an, it's an involuntary type of muscle. The cells of cardiac muscle tissue are shown here. So notice they are branched. They are the only uh, type of muscle cell that is branched. Um, another thing about cardiac muscle uh, cells is they have striations. You can see dark striations, light striations, dark striations, light striations, dark striations. So just like we saw with skeletal muscle cells, cardiac muscle cells uh, have striations, alternating dark and light striations. And it's caused by the same thing. The uh, dark striations are caused by the stacks of myosin inside the cardiac muscle cell, and the light striations are caused by the stacks of actin inside the cardiac muscle cell. Uh, yeah, so cardiac muscle cells have striations just like skeletal muscle cells do. But cardiac muscle cells have a feature that skeletal muscle cells do not, and that feature is called intercalated discs. If you look at the tips of the cardiac muscle cell here and here and here, if you look at them closely, uh, there's sort of a round shape there with tiny little holes in it. The, the round shape, the grayish round shape I'm showing here, is called an intercalated disc. And the little holes in the intercalated disc, you know, almost like almost like the intercalated disc was a piece of Swiss cheese with lots of little holes in it. Uh, anyway, the little holes in the intercalated discs are structures called gap junctions. And we talked about gap junctions earlier in the semester. Gap junctions are little openings that connect one cell's cytoplasm to the cytoplasm of its neighboring cells. Yeah, so each of those tiny little holes that you see in the intercalated disc is a gap junction, and it connects the cytoplasm of this cardiac muscle cell to the cytoplasm of all its neighboring cardiac muscle cells. And you can kind of see it a little bit better on this next slide, which is kind of a cartoon of cardiac muscle tissue. So for example, here is a cardiac muscle cell. You can see the striations um, there inside of it, and you can see it has a branch shape. But notice this dark line right here. That's the intercalated disc that connects this cardiac muscle cell to its neighboring cardiac muscle cell. And so, yeah, there are tiny little holes, tiny little gap junctions in that intercalated disc that connect the cytoplasm of this cardiac muscle cell to this cardiac muscle cell. And likewise, this cardiac muscle cell also has intercalated discs at its ends with their little gap junctions. So its cytoplasm is connected to the cytoplasm of its neighboring cardiac muscle cells. And this one cytoplasm is connected to this one cytoplasm. And this one cytoplasm is connected to this one cytoplasm. So all these cardiac muscle cells are have interconnected cytoplasms thanks to the gap junctions in their intercalated discs. 
And so you might be wondering, well, why is that? Why are all their cytoplasms connected? And the answer is this, because their cytoplasms are all interconnected, if one cardiac muscle cell gets a contraction signal, that contraction signal can spread very rapidly to all of the surrounding cardiac muscle cells. So they all contract in unison. And so, yeah, that's why they have these intercalated disc, discs so that entire regions of your heart can contract in unison uh, with each other. In other words, the interconnecting of their cytoplasms just makes for more efficient pumping of the blood. Anyway, yeah, so there's cardiac muscle cells, they have striations, they are branched, and at each tip of the branched cardiac muscle cell, you find these intercalated discs where they're, um, that, that have gap junctions to connect the cytoplasm of each cardiac muscle cell to its neighboring cardiac muscle cells. Yeah, here's this cartoon again. Uh, the, the striations you can see here, the intercalated discs are the darker lines right there. The next uh, slide shows you a photograph of actual cardiac muscle tissue. Uh, yeah, so within each cardiac muscle cell, you see the alternating dark and light striations of the myosin and actin stacks, but these darker lines right here are the intercalated discs where the cytoplasms of neighboring cardiac muscle cells uh, join to each other through gap junctions. Okay, for the rest of this lecture, we are only going to focus on skeletal muscles, you know, the, the voluntary muscles that attach to your bones to move body parts. Uh, so we're not going to discuss any more in this lecture smooth muscles or cardiac muscles. We are going to talk more about those types of muscle tissue later on in the semester. For instance, we'll talk about the cardiac muscle more when we do the lect lecture on the cardiovascular system. But yeah, so but for this lecture, everything else that from this point on in this lecture is going to be focusing only on skeletal muscles. Okay, so we've learned a little bit, a little bit about skeletal muscles already. You know that they are voluntary muscles, meaning you decide when they, you consciously control when they contract and relax, and their job is to move body parts. And the way they do it is that they are attached by way of tendons to the muscle, to, to the bones of your skeleton. And then when a skeletal muscle contracts, it pulls on those bones, which, uh, which then moves those bones, and that's how you move your body parts, right? Okay, uh, so we're going to now explore the uh, movement of body parts by your skeletal muscles in a little bit more detail. Uh, and But I think I will continue to use the bicep muscle uh, as an example of a, of a skeletal muscle and how it moves body parts. Okay, um, so first of all, um, skeletal muscles, uh, well, you can see here, they always attach uh, to bones by tendons. The little gray structures you see coming off the bicep muscle and attaching to the bones are called uh, tendons. And let me switch to my own sort of cartoon. Here we go. All right, so again, that's the bicep muscle right there. And this bone right here is the humerus, the, the bone in your arm. And this bone right there represents the uh, radius, one of the bones in your forearm. And there's the palm of your hand right there. Okay, um, so yeah, that's where the bicep muscle is located. And mu uh, skeletal muscles are always attached to bones by means of tendons. These, um, these pieces of dense connective tissue uh, are, are the tendons. Okay, so um, skeletal muscles, uh, they, they always cause movement at joints. Uh, joint is wherever uh, two bones meet. For instance, your elbow joint is composed of where your humerus bone uh, meets your radius bone. And there's actually another bone in the, in the forearm called the ulna, but just to keep the diagram simple, we'll just look at one of those forearm bones um, called the radius. Anyway, a joint is wherever two bones in the body meet each other, and uh, skeletal muscles cause movement of body parts by causing bones to move at, at the joint. Okay, and now, um, so as you can see here, the skeletal muscle attaches to bones by way of tendons. But an important point is um, a skeletal muscle attaches to both bones at the joint where the movement's going to occur, right? So this is the elbow joint, and the two bones that meet there are the humerus bone and the radius bone. And so notice the bicep, which is going to cause movement at the elbow joint, attaches to both bones of the joint, so both to the radius bone, sorry, both to the radius bone and to the, uh, to the humerus bone. Um, now, one of those, for an, an, an any given joint, one bone is always more movable 
than the other bone. Um, in the, in the, for the elbow joint, the radius bone is the more movable of the two bones, and the humerus is the less movable of the two bones. The muscles, no, I should say that the, the muscles tendons attach, attachment to the more movable bone is called the insertion. So your the insertion of your bicep muscle is into the uh, radius bone. So again, the term insertion means the, the, the muscle's attachment to the more movable bone of the joint, the, the bone that's going to move when the, when the skeletal muscle contracts. The skeletal muscle's other attachment, its attachment to the less move, movable bone, uh, is called the origin of, of the muscle. Good. So every skeletal muscle causes movement at joints, and it has tendons attaching to both bones of the joint. Um, but its attachment to the less movable bone is called the muscle's origin, and the muscle's attachment to the more movable bone, the bone that moves, is called the muscle's insertion. Okay, and so when a skeletal muscle contracts, it, it pulls the insertion towards the origin. And what that just means is that it, it pulls the more movable bone. The more movable, the more movable bone moves when the skeletal muscle uh, contracts. Okay, now, uh, so that's how your skeletal muscles move body parts. Uh, again, they, they attach to both bones, bones of a joint by way of tendons, and when they contract, they move the more movable bone. Um, now, so, you know, this is how the, how the bicep muscle uh, caused flexion of the forearm at the elbow joint. In other words, this is how the bicep muscle um, curled up the, uh, the forearm at the elbow joint. Now let's say that you now want to extend your forearm at the elbow joint. In other words, let's imagine that you now want to straighten your arm out again. Um, so how does that happen? Well, first of all, it does not happen by the bicep muscle making itself larger and pushing on that radius bone. Because remember that uh, muscles never generate any force by pushing. They only generate uh, forces by pulling. Yeah, so the, the bicep cannot straighten your arm out by forcing itself to a larger size and pushing on the radius bone. So that brings us back to the original question. Well, how then do you straighten your arm out once your bicep has, has flexed your, uh, your forearm at the elbow joint like you see here? Well, the answer is there's always going to be a second muscle that moves the, that moves the, uh, the joint in the other direction. So let me get back to the straight view right there. So what I'm saying is for movement at all of the joints in your body, there's always two opposing muscles. Um, and the, the, the two uh, opposing muscles um, attach to opposite sides of the bones. You can see there's the bicep attaching to this side of the humerus and this side of the radius. And this other muscle here, the opposing muscle for this particular joint is called the tricep. And it attaches to the opposite sides of, of those same bones that the bicep does. Okay, yeah, so that's the secret of how you can move the joint in both directions. One muscle moves the joint in one direction, and the other muscle moves the joint in the opposite direction, and, but they both do those movements by contracting. So let's see this. Uh, so when you want to flex your forearm at the elbow joint, you use your bicep, and so the bicep is contracting and providing the force for that movement in that direction. And when you want to extend your forearm at the elbow joint, in other words, straighten out your arm there at the elbow joint, now the tricep provides the force by contracting. Like that. That was so much fun. Let's uh, do it again. Uh, so yeah, when you want to flex your forearm at the elbow joint, oop, that wasn't supposed to happen. There we go. When you want to flex your forearm, uh, at the elbow joint, your bicep contracts, and when you want to extend your forearm at the elbow joint, your tricep contracts. So the yeah, the lesson there is that uh, one muscle moves the joint in one direction, and the other muscle moves the joint in the opposite direction, and so movement in each joint is controlled by two muscles, each pulling the bones in, in opposite directions. And the term for these uh, muscles in a, at a joint that pull the joint in opposite directions are called, is antagonists. Antagonist means opposing things. So for your elbow joint, your bicep and your tricep 
are antagonists for movement at that joint. And, and I don't have a cartoon of it, but just to name another joint, you know, think of your, your knee joint. You can flex your leg at the knee joint, or you can extend your leg at the knee joint. And again, there are two uh, uh, antagonistic muscles that do that. One is, uh, is called the, the quadricep muscles. They are at the, the front of your thigh, and the other are called the the hamstring muscles, and they are at the back of your thigh. But it's the same principle we just saw here for movement at the elbow joint. Um, two muscles on opposite sides of the bones of the joint that move the joint in, in opposite directions. Okay, well, so that's uh, some good generalizations about how skeletal muscles cause movement uh, of, of body parts. Um, I want to shift gear slightly now and uh, talk about the structure of, um, of skeletal muscles. In other words, what the parts of a skeletal muscle organ are. So imagine that we want to learn about the parts of, let's say, the bicep muscle. And so imagine that we have some, some sort of scalpel, some sort of knife, and we're going to cut the bicep muscle in half to see what it looks like inside so we can learn some of its parts. So imagine we do that, and here, here's what the, the bicep muscle would look like if it was cut in cross-section. Okay, so in this cross-section of a muscle, we see these little pink circle-like things. Those are the individual um, skeletal muscle cells so cut in cross-section. And, you know, here in this diagram from the textbook, they say muscle fiber, but remember, um, that's just a word that some textbook use for, this, for the skeletal muscle cells. Anyway, each of the little pink circles is a skeletal muscle cell seen in cross-section. And they kind of pulled one out so you can, you can see it. It's a long cigar shape, right? Okay, but uh, here's the thing. Each individual skeletal muscle cell is wrapped in a sheath of dense connective tissue. Notice there's kind of a, a white wrapping of this pink skeletal muscle cell. Uh, so yeah, that is a, 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 a sheath of, of dense connective tissue that surrounds and protects the skeletal muscle cell. Um, and remember, dense connective tissue is a tough leathery tissue, so it does make a nice protective wrapping for it. But it's not just that particular skeletal muscle cell. Each and every skeletal muscle cell in the organ has its own individual wrapping of dense connective tissue to protect it. But if you look a little closer at this diagram, you'll see that groups of skeletal muscle cells, each with their own wrapping of dense connective tissue, get wrapped up in yet another layer of dense connective tissue forming a structure called a fascicle. So a, fac a fascicle is a bundle of skeletal muscle cells uh, that where the bundle of cells is wrapped in a layer of dense connective tissue, this white tissue you see right here. So the whole thing is, is a fascicle. And notice that the entire muscle organ is made up of several fascicles wrapped together, right? You can see here's a fascicle, and here's a fascicle, and here's one, and here's one, and here's one, and here's one. Um, yeah, so each muscle organ is a bundle of fascicles. And there's yet another layer of dense connective tissue that holds all those fascicles together. And we call that the fascia of the muscle organ. The fascia is yet, yet another layer of, of uh, dense connective tissue. It's the outermost layer of dense connective tissue in the muscle organ. So notice that there's three different layers of dense connective tissue that are part of skeletal muscles. There's the smallest one, these uh, tiny sheaths of dense connective tissue that wrap each individual skeletal muscle cell, and then those groups of wrapped skeletal muscle cells are themselves wrapped in yet another layer of dense connective tissue, forming a bundle of skeletal muscle cells that's called a fascicle. And all the fascicles that make up the skeletal muscle organ are wrapped in yet another layer of dense connective tissue called the fascia. And incidentally, um, the the fascia, the, the outermost sheath of dense connective tissue, is continuous with the tendon. In other words, the tendon uh, of a skeletal muscle organ is just an extension of, of, the, of the fascia, of the dense connective tissue of the fascia. Okay, all of what we just covered, in other words, everything that you see here in this illustration is part of the structure of skeletal muscle organs. We're now going to zoom in our focus to the structure of individual skeletal muscle cells. So imagine now we're going to zoom in on just one skeletal muscle cell and see some of the structures inside individual skeletal muscle cells. All right, so here's our 
drawing of a typical skeletal muscle cell. We've covered some of this before. They are long cigar shapes. They have multiple nuclei. They have striations, meaning stripes. They have, you know, light striations, dark striations, light striations, dark striations. They have all alternating uh, dark and light striations all along the length of the, uh, uh, of the skeletal muscle cell. Okay, so let's talk about exactly what sorts of things we find inside skeletal muscle cells. Uh, so be before we actually get into the details of skeletal muscle cells, let me talk about cells in general. We talked about some of the organelles that you find inside cells in, in, in a previous lecture. And just to give some examples, here's the nucleus organelle that holds the, the DNA, the chromosomes, and the um, cell membrane is an organelle. And this is a mitochondria. It's where ATP is made. And these little round things are uh, vesicles and vacuoles. Yeah, we've we already covered some of the organelles that you find inside cells. Well, there's another organelle that we hadn't talked about yet, but I'll tell you its name now. This uh, organelle that I've colored in these two different shades of blue is called the endoplasmic reticulum. So the endoplasmic reticulum is an organelle that you find inside all cells, not just skeletal muscle cells, but all cells have this endoplasmic reticulum. Um, it's a membranous organelle, meaning that its walls are made of membrane, phospholipid bilayer, the same material that forms the plasma membrane of the cell. But anyway, yeah, this endoplasmic reticulum, uh, its walls are made of, of membrane, um, and it's a series of interconnected tubules. Um, so think of it yeah, as like hollow tubes whose walls are made out of membrane. Um, what's the function of the endoplasmic reticulum? Well, uh, it actually has several different functions, but what we're going to do is focus in on the function of the endoplasmic reticulum inside skeletal muscle cells, right? Because that's what we're talking about in this lecture is skeletal muscle cells. Okay, so to begin with, um, the endoplasmic reticulum uh, inside skeletal muscle cells has a special name uh, called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So this sort of purplish, membranous looking organelle that you see running the entire length of the skeletal muscle cell, that is the sarcoplasmic reticulum, but that's just the name of the endoplasmic reticulum that you find inside skeletal muscle cells. Um, let's imagine zooming in on the sarcoplasmic reticulum a little bit more closely. Here we go. So yeah, there's a close-up of the skeletal muscle cell. You see some nuclei there and some uh, dark and light striations. But anyway, the purple looking thing here is the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So what's its function in skeletal muscle cells? It serves as a storehouse for calcium ions. In other words, in skeletal muscle cells, the sarcoplasmic reticulum contains a high concentration of calcium ions. And you might wonder, well, why does the skeletal muscle store a whole bunch of calcium ions inside its sarcoplasmic reticulum. Well, we'll cover that later on in this lecture, but just as a preview, they are involved in contraction of the cell. Calcium ions play, plays a role in the contraction of skeletal muscle cells. Um, so like I say, we'll, we'll give more details about that later. But just make a mental note that calcium ions are involved in muscle tissue. They're involved in the contraction of skeletal muscle tissue. And the reason I, I point that out is I think some students mistakenly think that calcium ions only are important for bones. And it's certainly true that, that the bone extracellular matrix um, is contains a lot of calcium ions, but calcium ions do have other roles in the body other than bone. And yes, one of their roles is in, um, is in contraction of muscle cells. All right, let me go back to my kind of zoomed out view of the skeletal muscle cells. Now here, I'm not showing the sarcoplasmic reticulum or the calcium ions inside of it, but it, it is there in, inside the skeletal muscle cell. Um, another thing that you find inside skeletal muscle cells uh, are some um, protein filaments, and we, we talked about these before. If you imagine zooming in on a skeletal muscle cell, uh, you find some protein filaments. And remember, uh, filament means something that's uh, long and thin in shape, like, like a string or a piece of thread. One type of uh, protein filament that you find inside skeletal muscle cells are called myosin proteins. Um, you can see here that they form stacks, so you find stacks of myosin proteins inside uh, skeletal muscle cells. Another type of um, protein filament that you find inside skeletal muscle cells are called actin uh, protein filaments. Those are the ones I'm showing in yellow there, and those 
also are in stacks, as you can see in this illustration. Uh, notice that the actin filaments are thinner than the myosin filaments, so the myosin filaments are sometimes called the thick filaments of skeletal muscle cells, and the actin filaments are sometimes called the thin filaments of skeletal muscle cells. Um, notice also that the each stack of myosin filaments is flanked by stacks of actin filaments. In other words, for each stack of myosin filaments, there's a stack of actins to its left, and there is a stack of actins to its right. Uh, so I, we already covered the, the myosin uh, filaments and, and the actin filaments a little bit earlier in this lecture. But let me mention one more type of protein structure that you find uh, inside skeletal muscle cells, things called Z-discs. The um, Z-disc uh, is, a, is a structure found inside uh, skeletal muscles, and its job is to hold the stacks of actin. In other words, this Z-disc right here holds this stack of actin, and this Z-disc right here holds this stack of actin. Now, um, there are actually some other proteins other than the Z-discs that also are involved in holding the stacks of actin. But for this point in the lecture, um, we'll just talk about the Z-discs and, and their job holding the actin stacks. Well, the whole thing that you see in this illustration, the, the two Z-discs and the stacks of actin that they are holding and the stack of myosin in the middle. The whole thing that you see in this illustration is called one sarcomere. A sarcomere is a stack of myosins and the two stacks of actins held by Z-disc, you know, the stacks of actin and the Z-disc to the left of the myosin stack and the stack of actins and the Z-disc to the right of the myosin stack. The whole thing together is one sarcomere, or saying the same thing in a slightly different way, a sarcomere begins with a Z-disc, and then you have the stack of actin attached to that Z-disc, and then you have the stack of myosins in the middle of the sarcomere, then you have the next stack of, stack of actins, and then the, then the Z-disc that's holding that stack of actins. So from that Z-disc, all the actins, the myosins, the actins to that Z-disc is one sarcomere. All right, and um, you remember from what we talked about earlier with these filaments inside um, skeletal muscle cells is they are what allow the skeletal muscle cell to contract. When the skeletal muscle cell gets a motor signal from the nervous system, the actins slide inward over the myosins. Uh, that makes the whole arrangement shorter. The, the proteins themselves did not get shorter, but they're now arranged more compactly because those actins are now overlapping more with the myosins. And so as the sarcomeres get shorter, uh, as the actins slide inward, um, that makes the whole muscle cell uh, shorter. Okay, so you've uh, you know, we, we, we've covered this essentially so far. You know about the, the sliding filament um, concept of, of muscle contraction. Well, um, in my illustration, like I'm just showing you here, I made it look like each skeletal muscle cell only contains one sarcomere inside, and that's not true. That was just sort of a simplification I did in my illustrations. Uh, to introduce the concept. Um, in real life, there are many, many, many sarcomeres uh, inside each skeletal muscle cell, uh, not just one. Um, so let's begin to talk about that. The sarcomeres in skeletal muscle cells are actually linked to each other Z-disc to Z-disc. In other words, inside real skeletal muscle cells, you find chains of sarcomeres linked to each other. So here's an example of that. So right here is one sarcomere. You see the stack of myosin in the middle. Here's the Z-disc to the left of the sarcomere. Matter of fact, let me click here. Yeah, so there's the Z-disc at the start of the sarcomere. The light-colored zone right there is the stack of actin. They're not showing the actins, but there's a stack of actin there attached to that Z-disc. Here's the stack of myosins in the middle of the sarcomere. This clear zone right here is the next stack of actins on the right side of the sarcomere, and there's the Z-disc holding uh, that stack of actins. But there's another sarcomere just to its right, right? So here's the next sarcomere. This sarcomere also has its Z-disc, stack of actins, stack of myosins, stack of actins, Z-disc. That's that sarcomere. And then is, here's the next sarcomere. Z-disc, stack of actins, stack of myosins, stack of actins, Z-disc is the next sarcomere. And here's the next sarcomere, Z-disc, stack of actins, stack of myosins, stack of actins, uh, Z-disc. So you, you get the idea that inside real skeletal muscle cells, the sarcomeres are found linked to each other. So notice that um, the, 
the neighboring sarcomere share Z-discs. In other words, this Z-disc right here is the Z-disc both for this sarcomere and for this sarcomere. And this Z-disc right here is the Z-disc both for this sarcomere and for this sarcomere. And this Z-disc right here is the sarcomere for this uh, sorry, is this, this Z-disc right here is the Z-disc for this sarcomere and also for this sarcomere. Well, these long chains of linked sarcomeres that you find inside skeletal muscle cells have a name. Uh, each one is called a myofibril. So a myofibril is a chain of linked sarcomeres. And uh, as it turns out, skeletal muscle cells have many myofibrils inside them. This next slide shows that this whole thing right here is supposed to be one skeletal muscle cell. They cut it transversely so you can see what's inside the skeletal muscle cell, uh, and they peel back the membrane a little bit also, but there's one nucleus and there's another nucleus. Anyway, look at the illustration. You can see that each skeletal muscle cell is packed full of many myofibrils, and of course each myofibril is made of many linked sarcomeres. So how many sarcomeres total are there inside in each are there inside each skeletal muscle cell? I have no idea, but it's got to be just a huge, huge, huge number. Maybe millions or even billions, I don't really know, but it's going to be a lot, right? Because each myofibril is made out of many, many, many sarcomeres linked together, and each skeletal muscle cell has many myofibrils inside of it. So it, you know, there's just a huge number total of sarcomeres inside each skeletal muscle cell. But remember that each sarcomere uh, can contract when the skeletal muscle cell gets a nerve signal, and so all those sarcomeres contracting together is what makes the skeletal muscle cell contract when it gets the nerve signal. All right, well, um, I want to relate what we just learned about in terms of the um, myosin and actin uh, stacks of protein filaments inside skeletal muscle cells to the striations. So remember, the striations just mean stripes, and in skeletal muscle cells, you have alternating dark striations and light striations, dark striation, light striation, dark striation, light striation, all along the length of the skeletal muscle cell. Um, let's talk talk more about that. Um, oh, here's a photograph of um, some skeletal muscle tissue. And again, you can see it, dark striation, light striation, dark striation, light striation, dark striation, light striation, all along the length of the skeletal muscle cell. Yeah, so what I want to talk about is where the most come from. And I think I mentioned this earlier in this lecture, the dark striations are the stacks of myosin, and the light striations are the stacks of actin. And the, the, the dark striations, um, the reason why they're dark is because myosin filaments are thicker than actin filaments, so they cast a darker shadow. That's why the dark striations are the myosin stacks, and the uh, light striations are the actin stacks, and actins are very thin. They hardly cast any shadow at all, and so that's why they are the lighter striations. Uh, so that's the big picture, but I want to give you a little bit more details about the myosin stacks and actin stacks and how they relate to the striations. So let's imagine zooming in on one sarcomere. So remember, a sarcomere always has a, um, a stack of myosins in the middle and then a stack of actins to its left and a stack of actins to its right. So let's imagine zooming in on just one sarcomere. Uh, so here it is. You see, here's the stack of myosins. They kind of colored it in, in red there. Um, in thin blue is the stack of actins to the left of those myosins, and also in um, thin blue right here is the stack of actins to the right of that stack of myosins, and these ziggly things right here are the Z-disc. Here's the Z-disc at the beginning of the sarcomere, and here's this Z-disc at the end of that sarcomere. And of course, remember that uh, neighboring sarcomeres share Z-disc, so this Z-disc right here is also a Z-disc of the next sarcomere, which you see uh, beginning right there. And likewise, this Z-disc right here is shared not only by this sarcomere, but by the neighboring sarcomere over here along the myofibril. Uh, anyway, so um, remember that the, the dark striations, when you look at a skeletal muscle cell under a microscope, are caused by the stack of myosins. And that dark, those dark striations have an official name. They are called A-bands. So notice in this illustration, they say the A-band is equal to the stack of myosins. In other words, the, the A-bands, the dark striations, are equal in length to the stack of myosins because the, the A-band of the dark striation is caused by the uh, stack of myosins. The 
I bands are the official name for the light striations, the lighter regions, um, like you see here. And so the, the I bands uh, are caused by the actin stacks. But I need to be a little bit more explicit with that. The I bands are caused uh, by the part of the actin stacks that are not overlapping the myosins. In other words, only this part of the actin stacks that's not overlapping the myosins forms an I band. The part of the actins that are overlapping with the myosins, those ones just become part of the A band. Um, and you can see it again over here. The, the I band, the light band, is formed by the parts of the actin stacks that are not overlapping with the myosins. Um, not by the part of the actins that are overlapping with the myosins. Those ones are part of the uh, the, the dark band, the A band. Um, oh, so um, I should mention one thing. How do you remember that the dark bands are called A bands and the light bands are called I bands? Uh, well, the word dark just has one vowel in it, and that's an A, so that helps you remember that the A bands are the dark bands. And the word light only has one vowel, which is an I, and so that helps you remember that the... Um, that the I bands are the light bands. Uh, oh, so notice that in the middle of the I band is where the Z disc is, right? Well, that that Z disc casts its own shadow in the middle of the I band, and uh, that shadow that it casts, uh, so to speak, um, is called the Z line. The the Z line is a line within the I band that's caused by the, the shadow of, of the Z disc. Um, so let me go back to that photograph of a skeletal muscle tissue. Oh, yeah, so this is, sorry, this is just illustrating that, that squiggly line there are the Z discs. Um, so let me go back to that illustration of skeletal muscle tissue. That's, I mean, this photograph of it. Um, so, you know, there's an A band, a dark striation. Here's an I band, a light striation. A band, dark striation. I band light striation, you get the idea. But if you look very, very closely, you can actually see the Z line. Maybe this might be a good spot right here. So if you look very closely, you can see a small, darker area in the middle of the I band. That is the Z line. That's from the Z discs between this sarcomere and that sarcomere. And again, if you look very closely, you can see a faint dark line right there in the middle of the I band. That is the Z line formed by the Z discs between this sarcomere and that sarcomere. I don't know, I think it's kind of fascinating that you can actually see the structure of the sarcomeres um, by looking at, at, the, at the skeletal muscle cells under the microscope. Okay, so yeah, uh, so I do want you to know um, that the A bands are the dark striations, the I bands are the light striations, and that the A bands are caused by and, and equal in length to the lengths of the myosin stack, and the I bands are caused by the actins, but they are only the unoverlapped part of the actins, the part of the actins that are not overlapping the, um, the, um, uh, the myosins. Okay, um, let me give you a slightly different view here. Um, so this is supposed to be one sarcomere right here. Um, you know, here's the stack of myosins, Here's the stack of actins to its left and the Z-disc that's holding them. Here's the stack of actins to the right of that stack of myosins. And here's the Z-disc that's holding that stack of actins. So you have this, this whole thing here is one sarcomere. And of course, here's a neighboring sarcomere over there and a neighboring sarcomere over there. Okay, um, so as I was just saying a moment ago, um, the uh, so there you go, there's the sarcomere. Uh, but the, the I-bands, there we go, the I-bands, um, are from the unoverlapped parts of the actin stacks, the part of the actin stacks that are not overlapping with the uh, with the myosins. And so notice that this I band goes from there to there, right? It goes from the beginning of this stack of actins, the un unoverlapping part of it, to this part of the um, stack of actins, you know, again, the, the part that's not overlapping with the myosins. And likewise, the I band over here is just the unoverlapping unoverlapped part of the actins, the part where right here is the beginning of the unoverlapped part where they're not overlapping the myosins to this part right here. So just sort of remember that in your, yeah, file that in your memory banks, that the length of an I band is equal to the length of the actins that are not overlapping with the myosins. Okay, and this illustration is supposed to be when the muscle cell is relaxed, when, when a muscle cell is relaxed, 
um, there's relatively little overlap between the um, actins and the myosins. So here's a thought question. When I click the button here, the muscle cell is going to contract, and so those actins are going to slide inward over the myosins. Do you think that will make the I-bands longer, shorter, or not change the length of the I-bands? So let me, again, give you that question. When I click the button, the muscle cell is going to contract, and so that means the I-bands are going to slide inward over the myosins. And so do you think that will cause the length of the I-bands um, to get shorter, stay the same, or get larger? Well, the answer is that the I-bands get smaller when the muscle cell contracts. I'll click the button, we'll see that. So here comes the contraction. Those, those um, actin stacks slide inward. And so, yeah, notice that the I-bands have now gotten a lot smaller than when the muscle cell was contract. And why is that? Well, um, because, remember, the, the I-bands are the part of the actin stacks that are not overlapping with the, um, with the myosin stacks. So when the muscle cell contracts, most of those actins do overlap with the myosin stack, so those parts of the actins are no longer count part of the I-band, and so there's just a smaller amount of unoverlapped actins, so the I-bands get smaller. When the muscle cell relaxes, there's less overlap between the actins and the myosins, so the I-bands are longer, and when the muscle cell contracts, there's more overlap between the actins and myosins, so the I bands get smaller, there's less overlapped actin. Well, you get the idea. Muscle cell um, relaxes, I bands are longer, muscle cell contracts, I bands are shorter. Okay, now we are going to focus a little bit more on muscle cell contraction. We're going to fill in uh, even more details about how the contraction process works. So to begin with, um, you know that, that um, muscle cell contraction begins when the muscle cell receives motor nerve signals from motor neurons. But here's something kind of interesting. Oftentimes, one motor neuron controls several skeletal muscle cells simultaneously by means of things called collaterals. So here is a motor neuron. And so these branches of the axon are called the collaterals. And you might remember this. We, we, they were, the collaterals were mentioned briefly when we uh, did the chapter on the nervous system. And yeah, they are just branches of the axon, and each collateral has its own axon terminal, and so each collateral is able to secrete uh, neurotransmitters. Anyway, so motor neurons uh, have several collaterals, like you see here, and each collateral synapses with its own skeletal muscle cell. Um, and, and so one motor neuron can control contraction of several skeletal muscle cells simultaneously. And the whole system that you see here, the motor neuron plus all of the skeletal muscle cells that it, that it synapses with, that it controls, is called one motor unit. Yeah, so what you're seeing here is, is one motor unit. It's one motor neuron and all the muscle cells that that motor neuron uh, synapses with. All right, now um, I want to zoom in right here where you see this axon terminal of the, of the motor neuron um, synapsing with this skeletal muscle cell. Oh, sorry, I'm just going to illustrate that. Uh, yeah, the one motor neuron, when it has a signal, causes um, all the skeletal muscle cells in the motor unit to contract simultaneously. Um, anyway, what I want to do is focus in on um, just this axon terminal and its synapse with this particular skeletal muscle cell. But what we're going to learn about this particular synapse that you see right here applies to all the synapses between the motor neuron and, and the various skeletal muscle cells. But anyway, let's zoom in right there. So there's the axon terminal of the motor neuron, of that particular collateral of the motor neuron. Uh, here's the skeletal muscle cell. You can see some multiple nuclei and some uh, A bands, you know, dark striation there and a, a I band right there, for instance. Anyway, so this is the synapse. Uh, this is where the, the axon terminal of the motor neuron uh, forms a junction with the membrane of the skeletal muscle cell. Well, so. When we were talking about the nervous system, we would have called this a synapse, right? But when you're talking about the junctions between the motor neurons and the skeletal muscle cells, 
a different term is used. You say a neuromuscular junction, but don't let the name change fool you. The neuromuscular junction is a synapse. It's just the synapse between a motor neuron and a muscle cell is, is the neuromuscular junction. Okay, so anyway, um, you know that, that muscle cells contract when they receive um, signals from, from motor neurons. Um, and here we go. And furthermore, you know that the contraction of the skeletal muscle cell um, is from the sarcomeres uh, inside the skeletal muscle cell contracting, right? When those sarcomeres slide their actins inward and the sarcomeres get shorter, that's what causes the, um, the, uh, the skeletal muscle cell to get shorter, to contract. Um, so what I want to talk about now is, well, what makes those actins slide inward? You know, here's a sarcomere, Z disc, stack of actins, stack of myosin, stack of actins, another Z disc. So the whole thing's at one sarcomere. So yes, yeah, so what we're what we're investigating now is well, what makes those actins slide inward over the myosins when the muscle cell get, get gets a nerve signal. And to understand how it works, I want to zoom in just on one end of one myosin filament. But what we what we're going to see happening here at the end of this one myosin filament applies to all the myosin filaments, all the ends of all the myosin fil filaments. We're just going to use as an example this one end of this one myosin filament right there. Good, so let's imagine zooming in there like that. Okay, so here's the way it works. Um, each myosin protein at its end um, has some parts that stick out that are called myosin heads. These things that look like little I don't know, paddle arms sticking out of the myosin are called uh, the myosin heads. And the myosin heads are able to bind to the actin. In fact, the actin proteins have binding sites for those myosin heads uh, to fit into. Anyway, the myosin heads bind to the actin proteins. They say that the, the term they use is form a cross bridge. So we're saying that these myosin heads form a cross bridge with the actin proteins. Uh, anyway, yeah, the myosin heads bind to the actin proteins, and when they do, the myosin heads do a inward pulling motion on the um, on the actins, and that's what makes the actin slide inward. So the question we're addressing here is what what makes the actin slide inward, and the answer is the myosin heads pull the actins inward. And when I click the button, we'll we'll see that um, well these myosin heads. Um, are forming cross bridges right now with the actin. You know, they're binding to the actin. I click the button. Now they do what's called the power stroke. The power stroke is where they they slide the actin inward. And, you know, that takes energy. And remember that this molecule ATP is the energy source for proteins. So using the energy of ATP, the myosin heads do their power stroke where they um, pull, pull a bind to the actins and slide it inward. Matter of fact, let's just sort of uh, watch the whole thing play out for a bit right there. So myosin heads form cross bridge, and then using ATP, they do the power stroke, then they let go, and then the myosin heads form another cross bridge, then they do the power stroke using ATP energy, then they let go, then they cock themselves back and form another cross bridge, do the power stroke, let themselves go, and anyway, you get the idea. The myosin heads just keep doing this cycle over and over and over again, and that slat, that's what causes the actins to slide inward. Ooh, now those actin stacks are sliding inward over the myosins. What's this that we see coming into the, uh, the frame of the picture right here? Anybody remember what that is? That's the Z disc, right? Remember the stacks of actin are held in place by a Z disc. Um, and so notice that there's a limit to how far the actins can slide inward. The actins can only slide inward until the Z disc comes and, and crashes into the myosin. At that point, the actins can't slide inward anymore because, well, because the Z disc is there and it collides with the myosins and that, so there's no more, no more room for contraction. Anyway, so what we just saw here is the big picture of how the um, sarcomere, uh, sorry, how the, uh, yeah, how the sarcomere contracts. Let me zoom out here. So here's the sarcomere, Z disc, Stack of actin, stack of myosin. Now I'm showing their myosin heads. Uh, stack of actin, Z disc. There's one sarcomere. Yeah, and so when the nerve signal arrives, 
how the sarcomeres shorten is like this. The myosin heads grab hold of the actins, slide them inward using that power stroke, you know, using ATP as an energy source, and they keep sliding the actins inward, but there's a limit to how far they can slide them, and that's uh, when the Z-disc uh, crashes into the myosins. Okay, I think your knowledge of how the sarcomeres uh, contract is pretty complete. You know that on each sarcomere, the myosins have these myosin heads, which bind hold of the actins, and the myosin heads, using their power stroke, slide the actins inward, and that's what makes the uh, sarcomere contract. Uh, but there's one more detail that we need to add to our picture of sarcomere contraction for it to be complete. And here's what it's all about. Uh, there are some proteins called troponin and tropomyosin that block the myosin heads from binding to the actin when the muscle cell is relaxed. R relaxed meaning that the muscle cell is not getting a, a nerve signal at that time point, and so it's, it's not contracting. Um, yeah, so there are some proteins that block the myosin heads from binding to the actin when the muscle cell is relaxing. Um, so let's investigate these proteins. Imagine that we're going to zoom in on these myosin heads of this particular um, myosin filament, but what we see going on with these myosin heads applies to all of the myosin heads in the, uh, in the sarcomere. Here we, are, here we are zoomed in on those myosin heads, and you see the surrounding actins in yellow right there. Okay, so what I'm saying is, um, yes, the, the, the actins do have binding sites for the myosin heads, but when the muscle cell is relaxing, the myosin uh, heads are blocked from binding to the actin by some proteins. And one of these proteins is called tropomyosin. That's the TM in this illustration. Yeah, so tropomyosin is wedged between the myosin heads and the actin. And so it's the protein that's blocking the myosin heads from binding on the actins and sliding them inward when the muscle cell is relaxing. But that other protein that I'm showing in purple there is a T is called troponin. And that's important also. The troponin holds the tropomyosins in place. Uh, think of the troponin as like a thumbtack that keeps the tropomyosins in their blocking space right there. Okay, so yeah, when a muscle cell is relaxing, the myosin heads are blocked from binding to the actin and sliding it inward because of these pr proteins, the troponin and the tropomyosins. Okay, but when a nerve signal does arrive at the muscle cell, those actins are supposed to slide inward, and so we have to have those uh, tropomyosin proteins removed from their blocking position right here. So let's investigate how that happens. So when the nerve signal arrives, how is it exactly that these tropomyosin proteins are removed from their blocking position on the myosin heads? Well, uh, here's the way it works. Uh, some calcium ion, when the nerve signal arrives, some calcium ions get into the cytoplasm of the muscle cell. Now, if you had to guess, where do you think these calcium ions come from? And your guess is correct if you guessed from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Remember that inside skeletal muscle cells, there's a membranous organelle uh, that's filled with a large concentration of calcium ions. So what I'm saying is when the motor nerve signal arrives at the skeletal muscle cell, the sarcoplasmic reticulum allows those calcium ions to exit and go into the cytoplasm. So that's where these calcium ions come from, from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And these calcium ions that we're about to see are what remove those blocking proteins, the troponin and the tropomyosins. Okay, so the calcium ions, uh, they, they uh, bind to the troponins first, and they pull the troponins off of the tropomyosins. But since those troponins are what hold the tropomyosins in place, once the troponins are gone, then the tropomyosins leave, and now the myosin heads are able to bind to the actin. So the calcium ions remove those blocking proteins, and when that happens, the myosin heads can now bind to the actin filaments and do their power stroke, you know, using ATP energy to slide those um, actins inward. Okay, and um, well, you know what the power stroke uh, looks like, so I'll fast forward it a little bit. Go faster, go faster. There we go. Oh, 
so again, kind of a review question, what's coming into the view right there? That's the Z-disk. And remember that sarcomeres can contract up to a point, but they, they can't contract anymore when the Z-disk runs into the, uh, the myosin heads like you see there. Anyway, so the point of all this is that when a muscle cell is relaxing, the myosin heads can't bind the actins because those troponins and tropomyosins are blocking the myosin heads from binding to the actins. Uh, but when the nerve signal arrives, when the motor signal arrives, calcium ions remove those troponin and tropomyosin proteins, and then that allows the myosin heads to bind to the actins and slide them inward, and the sarcomeres contract. Uh, but we're not quite done yet. I want to now answer a question. How exactly does the motor nerve signal arriving at the skeletal muscle cell, how does that lead to the calcium ions uh, being secreted into the cytoplasm? Well, to understand how that works, um, actually, let me just recap this here. So when the uh, motor neuron has a nerve signal, it sends that nerve signal to the um, to the skeletal muscle cells, and they contract because their sarcomeres contracted, and the sarcomeres contract because the uh, myosin heads slide the actins inward, and the myosin heads are able to bind to the actins because those troponins and tropomyosin proteins were removed by calcium ions. But yes, the question I'm addressing now is how did that motor signal lead to the calcium ions being secreted into the cytoplasm of the, um, of the skeletal muscle cells? Well, um, to answer that question, we need to zoom in on one neuromuscular junction. Remember, the neuromuscular junction is the synapse between uh, the axon terminal of uh, one of the axon terminals of the motor neuron and the skeletal muscle cell. So let's imagine zooming in there. Here it is. There's the axon terminal. Here's the skeletal muscle cell. There's the neuromuscular junction. And let's imagine zooming in one step further so we can really have a nice close up of the neuromuscular junction. There's the axon terminal. Here is the cytoplasm of the uh, skeletal muscle cell. Okay, let me bring a few more things into the picture here. Uh, this purple thing down at the bottom with the calcium ions in it represents the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And again, it's a membranous organelle found inside skeletal muscle cells, and it contains a large concentration of calcium ions. And you know from previous lectures that all solutes want to want to diffuse down their concentration gradients. They want to go from their high concentration area to their low concentration area. So these calcium ions want to diffuse into the, into the cytoplasm. But of course, they can't do it because they're inside the sarcoplasmic reticulum. This green looking thing right here is a calcium ion channel. Uh, so when it opens up, it's going to allow those calcium ions to diffuse down their concentration gradient. In other words, when it opens up, these calcium ions are going to exit the sarcoplasmic reticulum and go into the cytoplasm of the skeletal muscle cell. And lastly, that little protein right there in the membrane is the receptor for acetylcholine neurotransmitter. Um, so maybe I should mention that for all skeletal muscle cells, acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter that causes them to contract. In other words, uh, motor neurons that synapse with skeletal muscle cells, those motor neurons secrete the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, and so skeletal muscle cells all have neurotransmitter receptor proteins for acetylcholine. Um, and you might remember from our lecture on the uh, nervous system that the receptors for neurotransmitters are ion channels. That is, when the receptor for a neurotransmitter binds its neurotransmitter, it opens up and allows ions to enter the, uh, the cell. And as it turns out, these acetylcholine neurotransmitter receptors are sodium ion channels. When they bind acetylcholine, they allow uh, sodium ions to enter into the, uh, into the uh, skeletal muscle cell. OK, so let's watch this whole process in, in action now. Uh, so the motor neuron has a motor nerve signal running through it, and that motor signal reaches the axon terminal, like you see here. That motor signal causes the axon terminals to secrete acetylcholine neurotransmitters. The acetylcholine neurotransmitters diffuse across the synaptic cleft, the little space here in the neuromuscular junction, and some of those neurotransmitters will bind to the acetylcholine receptor. The Acetylcholine receptor is a chemical gated sodium channel, meaning it's a sodium channel. It opens up and allows sodium ions to enter. And when we say it's chemical gated, it means 
what opens it up is a chemical, a molecule, in this case, the acetylcholine. All right, so uh, yeah, the acetylcholine has bound to that acetylcholine neurotransmitter receptor, which is a sodium ion channel. So it opens up and starts allowing sodium ions to flow into the inside of the skeletal muscle cell. And that causes the skeletal muscle cell to get positive inside, right? Because sodium ions have a positive charge. And we, we say that the skeletal muscle cell is now depolarized. This should sound a little bit familiar because we saw pretty much exact, exactly the same thing in our lecture on the nervous system, right? We saw in, in the nervous system lecture that when neurons receive neurotransmitters, likewise, those neurotransmitters caused um, chemical gated sodium ion channels to let allow sodium ions in. They bring, they make the inside of the neuron positively charged. And we say that the neuron became depolarized when it became positively charged. Pretty much the exact same thing is going on here, but now it's taking place. The depolarization is inside a skeletal muscle cell, not inside a nerve cell. Anyway, so when the acetylcholine from the um, motor neuron binds to the acetylcholine receptor, it opens up, allows sodium ions in. That makes the inside of the skeletal muscle cell positively charged. We say the skeletal muscle cell is depolarized. And now that brings us to this calcium ion channel right here. The calcium ion channels um, are voltage-gated channels. And what voltage-gated channels do is they open up when the area around them gets positive, gets depolarized. And so since the skeletal muscle cell is now depolarized, is now positively charged inside, that is what opens the calcium ion channel right there. And so now calcium ions diffuse out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum and go into the cytoplasm of the skeletal muscle cell. And that leads to the sarcomeres contracting, right? Because we talked about that. When the calcium ions go inside the cytoplasm, they remove the troponins, which allows the tropomyosins to uh, leave their blocking position. And without those tropomyosins blocking the myosin heads, the myosin heads now bind to the actins. And you start getting the uh, power stroke, and that slides the actins inward, and that makes the sarcomeres contract. Actually, um, let me speed this up slightly. Good. Whew. So um, you now know all the details about how motor signals cause skeletal muscle cells to contract. Just to give some of the highlights, review some of the highlights, the motor nerve signal comes down into the axon terminals. Uh, the axon terminals secrete acetylcholine. Acetylcholine opens up some sodium ion channels, which depolarizes the skeletal muscle cells, makes them positive inside. The depolarization of the skeletal muscle cells uh, allows calcium ions to flood into the cytoplasm of the skeletal muscle cells. And once the calcium ions get into the cytoplasm, the calcium ions remove those blocking proteins, troponin and tropomyosin, which allows the myosin heads to bind to the um, actin filaments, which slides the actin filaments inward on all the sarcomeres. All the sarcomeres contract, therefore the skeletal muscle cells contract. Whew. I know that's a lot of details, but that is how contraction of skeletal muscle cells uh, works. And yeah, it's very detailed, but I, hopefully you're impressed. It's, it's kind of a miraculous and amazing process. Okay, this brings us to the end of part one of this lecture on the muscular system. And so now please watch part two of this lecture on the skeletal muscle system.